totally forgot to unmute myself. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today um, for our parent workshop. This is the first part in our uh, spring parent well wellness webinar series. Um, today's um, workshop is focusing on strategies for parents in um, dealing with students with trauma. We appreciate you all for joining us for today. Um, like the song said, it is a lovely day, right? It's a lovely day. We're here. Um, I, I, I understand that a lot of us have um, other things that are going on in our lives right now. So we appreciate you for joining us today. My name is Will Safotu. I am a school counselor with the Family Resource Centers, specifically in the downtown central region. I am joined here by my colleagues, Kimberly, Kimberly Yermia, school counselor, and Roxy Carboni, school psychologist. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. Today's session is a webinar format, and we are recording our session today for uh, friends that cannot join us. And uh, we will be posting this uh, at a later, at a future date on our YouTube, um, YouTube playlist on the district channel. Um, if you do want uh, to communicate with us, or if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat and we will answer them accordingly as best as we can. I know um, we will have some time towards the end of our workshop today to answer any questions that anybody might have. Um, and I think that's all um, I am pleased to introduce to you. If you've been on um, some of our other workshops that we've hosted alongside uh, with ChildNet, our good friend, Julie Turvey, um, LMFT, who is presenting for us today. Um, she is very knowledgeable and um, she's so appreciative of her time and joining us today as well. Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you everyone again. Thank you, Julie. Hi, good afternoon, almost, yes, almost afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Thank you, Kimberly. How is everybody doing today? Um, let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. Sorry, one second. Let's get it popped up here one more time. On a scale of one to 10, if you can write in the chat box, how is your day going so far? I really appreciate all of you being here today. And all right, a seven, that's great. Good to hear that. And let's see some others here. Looks like a, an eight. All right, great job. Again, thank you so much for being here. Just to introduce myself in case you weren't on some of our other webinars. My name is Julie Turvey and I'm a licensed marriage family therapist and I work at ChildNet Youth and Family Services in Long Beach. We provide free counseling for children ages zero to 18 that have Medi-Cal insurance. And we provide services for quite a few students in Long Beach Unified. And I'm just so grateful to the district for partnering with us for these parent workshops. So, and I'm really excited it will be recorded as well because we know some of you are working full time or you may not get to stay the whole time, but um, really thankful that these will be on YouTube. So. We'll go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover today. We have a couple videos and I wanna make sure we're done um, hopefully within our one hour time frame. So um, hope you have, hope you enjoy it and just have a great rest of your day as well. All right, so welcome. We're so glad you're here. We know that you are all busy and um, we thank you for your time. So I wanted to start, our topic today is supporting youth with trauma symptoms. So before we get into that, I did want to review what is trauma. I know sometimes we hear that word trauma and we know about, you know, trauma rooms in ER departments, but this is a little bit different. So this is an emotional trauma that we'll be talking about today. Um, it's an emotional response to an intense event that can threaten or cause harm to an individual. And that can be either physical, emotional, and often overwhelms the individual's ability to cope. There's lots of different types of trauma and we'll be talking about several different types today. There's um, things like physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, 
There are natural disasters that can be a trauma. It can be witnessing the death of a loved one or maybe um, witnessing something violent. It can also be a medical trauma. We know when someone is hospitalized um, and, and maybe has a lot of intensive treatments that also can be traumatic and kind of overwhelm someone's normal ability to cope. Also things like domestic violence or what we call intimate partner violence, which can be inside relationships and then community violence. It can be youth walking to school and they witness someone getting attacked or someone harmed and they're not quite sure how to cope with that. Um, you know, our bodies witness lots of things and sometimes it kind of overwhelms that ability to cope. So there can be lots of different types and we wanted to highlight those there. And I wanted to highlight, sometimes we, you know, we, we know about big events and we know those can be traumatic to our system, but sometimes there's smaller things that kind of build up over time that also can have an effect. So this is called big T and little T's that can happen in our lives. So the big T traumas are things like serious accidents, natural disasters, um, can be something like, you know, maybe someone is robbed or there's a violent act that occurs for them. But there's also smaller traumas and based on everyone's, you know, we all have different levels of sensitivity and, um, you know, based on their life experience, these things also can build up over time. And we want to make sure that these unprocessed traumas do get treatment and that we do honor those as well. So I would say just because you haven't had a really large traumatic event, there might be a lot of smaller things that have happened that could have affected your mental health and your ability to cope. And um, if you have questions as we go, I know that this format is not quite as interactive as in person and I'm missing everyone in person so much. Um, but if you can put a question in the chat box, I will make sure to check that and also our school district staff will be checking that as well. So the goal of today's workshop is that I want to give you all hope that we can heal from trauma and our bodies, you know, are really amazing in that they can heal, but it does need to be under the right conditions. And one of those conditions is healing relationships. So that healing relationship can be from a parent, it can be from a teacher, it can be a therapist. There's lots of people involved in children's lives that can really impact their healing. So I wanna give you hope that things can improve, things can get better over time. So some of the signs and symptoms, you know, how do we know that a child has been a victim of trauma? Of course, besides them telling us about that, there are some behavior issues that you'll start to notice. Though some of these can be from other mental health disorders as well, but we did wanna highlight these just so you're aware. That startling easily and having a difficult time calming down can be a trauma response. Sometimes children exhibit behaviors that are more younger ages than what they currently are. So things like thumb sucking, bedwetting, fear of the dark, clinging to their caregiver. You know, maybe they've, um, you know, They've overcome that bedwetting, but all of a sudden they regress a little bit. So sometimes that can be a common symptom. Tantrums, aggression, and fighting. Youth often don't know how to tell us what's going on with their words. And so they act it out with their behaviors and things like aggression. Also just being more quiet or withdrawn. Maybe if a child is normally pretty talkative and outgoing and you notice a big personality shift, that could be a sign that something's going on. Some youth want to talk frequently about what happened and then others do the opposite. Others might deny that it happened. So just know that all of that is very normal. Um, I've been at schools and had clients, you know, talk very openly in front of a lot of people about a very traumatic thing that he witnessed. And then there's others again that really don't wanna talk about it and that's okay too. We wanna really trust their process and um, you know, let them tell us when they're ready. Also, there can be changes in eating or sleeping patterns. And then sometimes some frequent headaches or stomach aches. We know children with anxiety often have these as well where they have those headaches and stomach aches. So, um, but 
if you notice some of these things happening, it might be good to reach out for support and ask them questions about how they're doing. So as parents, what can we do? I know that as parents, we always wanna keep our children healthy and safe. Of course, we never want anything bad to happen to them, but unfortunately, sometimes, you know, our world is not a safe place. And whether it's things like the pandemic, we know that this whole, you know, year has been stressful and had some trauma impact on all of us. Um, and then there's things like we said, you know, a car accident or they witnessed something violent. Or maybe as a parent, um, we've done things that we know are not good for our children. So in order to correct the trauma, there's definitely some interventions that we can do. The most important thing for us is to create safety. And we know that um, the way that our brains work, if our brain does not feel safe, if we don't feel safe, we can't really respond to other tasks that are needed. It's hard for us to learn. It's hard for us to respond in a way that is helpful when we don't feel safe. So that calm, consistent schedule that we can create in our home can really calm that trauma response in a child. And giving them lots of praise and reassurance that everything is okay, that all is well, that you're gonna be there for them can really help to calm that nervous system. And that freedom to make mistakes is also really important. We know that just as you know, we're learning and growing as adults, children are learning and growing and they need to feel safe to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. So basically the brain needs to feel safe before it can reason and start to heal. We're gonna watch a video about that here shortly. So this next video, um, it's about the neurosequential model, which was created by Bruce Perry. Um, I'm actually not gonna play the whole video, but this is on YouTube. So you can look it up um, when you have time. and. Um, but I think it does a great job of showing how the brain repairs itself and that it actually needs to happen in a certain order. So this will help you learn the order of repairing that traumatic brain and then what we can all do to support that. attachment disorder, but is this what's really going on in my brain? It is actually only one part of a seven-piece jigsaw puzzle called developmental trauma. If you put this puzzle together, you can understand how my adverse childhood experiences have shaped my emotional world and behaviour you see. Once you have taken the time to understand this, you can help me using something called the neurosequential model of therapeutics. It's not as complicated as it sounds. It repairs my brain in a special order, where everyone who's part of my work needs to work together to make sure that I have the best chance to heal. This means home, school, therapy, and even my doctor needs to work together as a team. If you get this right, my developmental trauma can be repaired. You have probably heard of attachment styles. Most people working with children and young people have. It's the way children's brains have developed to survive dangerous situations. By behaving in a certain way, we believe that adults around us will keep us alive. But now, Dr. Patricia Christensen has proved that Children are even more incredible at surviving than we first thought. She has shown that we don't always stay in one attachment style. We change and organise our behaviour to make sure we can survive in the moment we are in. In fact, I am so incredible at changing my behaviour to survive my different environments, it can be hard for you to believe what's really going on inside of me. I can be very good at school but break down at home or unable to cope with school, but be great at home. We are starting to realise that not all grown-ups know about the seven-piece jigsaw puzzle called developmental trauma. A child who has had early...
sexual needs, and any child who has suffered separation and loss from their family can suffer developmental trauma. A psychiatrist, Bessel van der Kolk, has taught us that the seven jigsaw pieces of developmental trauma includes somatic sensory issues in my brainstem, attachment, emotional regulation and behavioural regulation issues in my limbic brain, self-esteem issues, dissociation and cognitive problems in my cortical brain. If you want to support me, then you need to consider every single one of these jigsaw pieces because I suffered early adverse experiences. I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. Together to help repair my brain. One, everyone needs to understand developmental trauma. Two, make sure every environment in my life is stable. Three, Make sure your most trusted adult is supported and nurtured. If home is not safe, nothing else will be effective. Four, look after my trusted adult. Their brain is my safe place. If they are okay, over time it will calm my feelings. Five, start in my brainstem. I cannot process conversations until my primitive brain has been repaired. If you try, I will fail and you could make things worse as my brain is trying to do something it isn't capable of at the moment. 6. Normal parenting doesn't work. My parental care will need to parent me therapeutically and will need support doing this so they can teach me how to regulate my world and I can learn to feel safe in that relationship. 7. If I'm stuck in my brain stem, the treatment needs to be patterned and repetitive. I need my fear response calmed and to re-attune in my important relationship. This sensory work needs to be done first before I can process any other type of therapy. A. Retraining my brainstem will take time. I need consistent, predictable, pattern and very frequent brainstem activities before you can expect me to think, learn and reflect. Changing my whole brain will take persistence at time. 9. Each part of my world needs to be working on the same place. Brain repair bottom up. Home, school and therapy need to understand which part of the brain they are working on and doing it together. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Let me just exit here. So hopefully that was helpful for you to get a sense of how the brain repairs itself, that it goes from a bottom up perspective, creating that safety first before the rest can um, feel safe for them. Now we did get a question in the first workshop about how, and we're gonna, some of these we're gonna teach as we go. I'm gonna read it really quick. Um, they were interested in strategies for parents who don't live with their child and who are responsible for some of the trauma the child has experienced. So I did want to address that really quick in case we run out of time. I think that's a great question and I think that took a lot of courage for the parent to ask that question. So kind of as the video was sharing, creating that sense of safety can be really helpful for the child. Um, that consistency in the connection with the child. So even if they're not living with them, if you have visits, making sure that those are, you know, that you show up for the visits and you're consistent with those, that you are also as a parent continuing to work on yourself so that you can make sure that it will be a safe environment if the child is returned to you. Um, I also wrote down that patience. It does take time to repair that relationship. So not giving up and just believing in the process that as you heal yourself as a parent and you work on perhaps if you have your own trauma and um, you know figuring out why the home wasn't safe and making those changes, it will get better over time. 
So we will go over a few more of these interventions, but I did want to address that. And thank you for that question. So if the child does live with you, creating that structure together can be really helpful. So I know that, you know, we talked earlier about that consistent environment is helpful, but we don't want to make it so controlled by the parent that the child feels like they don't have choice or say in the matter. So I would say to sit down together and talk about what, what do we want our days to look like? We know that you know we have school, we may have work, we have a lot of things happening. And what time do we want to eat breakfast? What time is a great time to meet for lunch? Um, you know, do we all sit down for dinner together? Hopefully, that can be a nice time of connection. We want to still set boundaries with children that have trauma. We know that you know even if they've had a hard thing happen, it's still important to have that structure in the home to say no and to set limits. And, um, but we do wanna try to avoid adding more shame or guilt, blame or coercion that can sometimes cause children to do the opposite or be a little more rebellious. But if they're involved in the decision-making like creating that daily schedule together, that really helps teach them that sense of independence and help them feel like they do have some choices in their environment. And if you guys have questions about that further, I'm happy to answer that as well. So we know that part of our job as parents is to help our children develop those emotional skills that they're gonna need in life. And if we can help them as parents to do this, they're gonna be so ahead of the game and it's really gonna help them to be able to navigate challenging situations, including overcoming something like trauma. So, um, you know, obviously as a parent, just listening is so powerful. I know that sometimes we feel like we do listen as parents, but I know myself as a parent, I have 20 year olds. Um, I don't really listen as much as I, I could, or, or perhaps I should, you know, I know we're busy. We have a lot on our to-do list, but really taking that time to listen and to repeat back what you heard them say can be very powerful. So when I say repeat that back, you don't have to interpret it. You can honestly just repeat it. Oh, I hear you saying that you have a lot of homework today and you're not sure how you're going to get that done. Or I hear you saying that you're frustrated with your sister that she didn't, that she took your favorite toy. Or it can be, um, I hear you saying that you're really angry at me that I'm setting a boundary right now. I understand you're angry and that's okay to be angry. So just repeating back what you're, what you heard them say or repeating back what actions they have helps them to know that you do notice and that you care and that, um, you know, that you're involved in what they're doing. So another great way to help them process these feelings is called the ROAR technique. And if you were in one of my other um, webinars we had here, we did talk about this, but it's a nice, simple technique I think is easy to remember. So we have a picture of a lion roaring. It doesn't mean you're gonna like roar at the top of your lungs. Of course, if you want to, you know, that's fine if it's not at the kids. <laughs> but um, the roar technique is basically a simple tool to allow us to help those feelings process. So basically our feelings um, they, once they're named and once they're noticed, often they can get released. It's more when we block the feeling or we shut down the feeling that it gets stuck. So this is a nice way to process it and it's called ROAR. So the, the first R is for recognize. What am I feeling right now? Maybe a strong emotions coming up. Maybe our heart is racing. Maybe our face is getting red. Maybe just something, maybe there's just an overwhelm of sadness that we weren't sure where it's coming from. So let's recognize what it is, allow it, and observe it, which is the second O. Observe it without judgment. Know that there is no right or wrong feeling. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be happy. Um, but sometimes we judge a feeling and we push it down because we think we shouldn't feel that way. But feelings, again, come and go, we want to allow them. And that is something that we do in therapy. We help children learn to name the feeling, to allow the feeling, and then to let that feeling go. So the third step is to accept the feeling. Now, this doesn't mean that you accept the situation. 
I know often situations may feel really unfair or we may feel frustrated with the situation, but we can accept that feeling of frustration or maybe that feeling of overwhelm. Um, and then the last step is to release the feeling. So we allow that feeling to release when it's ready. And for some that release could be right away. It could be after just a couple deep breaths, uh, maybe within five minutes, we're able to release it. Other times that feeling might take longer. We might need you know, a day, we might need a couple hours. So, but the feeling usually will release when it's ready. And I think just allowing those feelings to flow can really help. So as parents, you can tell children too, look, I didn't learn this stuff when I was growing up. Most of us didn't. Um, you know, you can say I'm learning how to process my feelings a little bit more healthy. And I learned this new technique, it's called ROAR, and maybe we can all practice it together. So I was always as a parent, you know, trying, teaching my kids that I'm learning and growing. I'm always, you know, I'm definitely not perfect. And, you know, but if we kind of learn these things together, it helps children feel like it's okay to be learning and growing and um, practicing these skills. So um, besides the emotional skills, I think just that tangible giving hugs really can calm that nervous system. So if you're not quite sure what to do, you might ask them, would you like a hug right now? Um, we always wanna ask, cause sometimes that's not what someone wants. Sometimes they want more space, but hugs can really be a great way to just calm down that nervous system. There's actual physical changes that happen in our body when we give a hug. And, you know, follow their lead and be patient. Sometimes um, they may not know what they want, depending on the age of the child. So, um, you know, maybe asking them what they need. Do you need a little space? Um, would you like to talk about it? And just allowing them to kind of just let them know that you're there and that you care and that you're with them. And giving those positive statements and encouragement can be really helpful. I know they might be having a lot of negative thoughts. Um, I can't do this, this is too much. You know, those kinds of negative thoughts that aren't helpful. And, but you kind of balancing out those thoughts can be really helpful. Things, saying things like, I love you, you matter to me, you're so important, you are brave, you're strong, you're talented. Feeding into them with those positive affirmations can really help balance some of those negative thoughts that they might have. Now in therapy, we often teach relaxation because we know that's a great way to calm our bodies down. And in order to make good decisions, our body has to be calm. So a great way to calm down our bodies quickly is just to take some slow, deep breaths. And you might tell them, hey, let's practice some slow, deep breaths together. Three seconds in, three seconds out. Um, your belly should actually move when you do take those deep breaths. So as you see my shoulders lifted, that's okay, that's good, but that's not as good as your belly actually um, going in and out. And those are those really good deep belly breaths. Also listening to calming music can be really helpful. Children, sometimes words don't work, but music can be a great way to connect to a certain emotion that, that you're wanting them to have or that they might want to feel. And then just reassuring them with statements like that must have been scary, but you're safe now. Again, children want to feel safe and that's the very first thing that they need in order to make rational decisions or to heal. I'm gonna check the chat box really quick. Okay, thank you for sharing that trauma video. I really appreciate that, Will. All right, so something that victims of trauma need is empathy. And I know we hear that word empathy quite a bit, but what actually is empathy? Sometimes we think we're being empathetic, but we're actually not. And it's okay if you're not, you didn't know what you didn't know, right? So that's why we do these kinds of trainings. And even as therapists, we're always working on that as well. Um, so what empathy is basically is helping the other person to feel understood. Being present, understanding that someone else's point of view is not our own. 
and stepping into their shoes without needing to change or fix them. Now, I know that's hard as a parent because we don't always like when our children are suffering, right? We want them to be happy and healthy. So of course, if they're feeling sad or they're feeling overwhelmed, we want to change it and we want to fix it. And that's natural. But actually, when we do that, it, it makes them feel like they're not safe sharing those emotions with us. So a more helpful thing to do might be to say, I'm here for you. Thank you for sharing that with me. I'm so glad you told me. Um, I'm happy to listen to you anytime. You can also say, what, what do you need right now from me? Would you like me to just sit with you and be with you? Um, would you like to talk about solutions? You know, maybe put it back on them to see what they might need at that moment. Um, and then just, you know, emphasizing, I'm so proud of you that you're talking about this. I know that this isn't easy to share. It takes a lot of courage for children to share their feelings. And so we want to make sure that um, they know that it's a safe place to do so. Now, it can be challenging when you're a parent because sometimes you feel like, oh, that's not true or that didn't happen or that's not how I saw it. Um, but in that moment, if you can, just try to really um, use that empathy to make sure that they feel that connection. What empathy is not, just wanted to put this in here really quick. Empathy is not judgment, it's not criticism, it's not advice, agreeing or disagreeing, interrogating, correcting, shutting down, telling your own story, consoling, fixing, taking the blame, like, oh, it's all our fault, I shouldn't have done that. You know, I think it's fine to take some responsibility, but sometimes that also takes the attention off what they're experiencing. And then evaluating it as well. So if you happen to fall into some of those, just wanted to highlight those so you're aware. All right, so um, often when someone goes through trauma, there it changes the way that they think about the world. And the way that we think impacts how we feel about the world and then impacts our behaviors. So this is a short video that talks about the connection between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And this is also available on YouTube. You can show your child if you like, and it's a nice conversation starter about, wow, what are the negative thoughts that are perhaps impacting my behaviors? I had a client I worked with who um, she had been pretty severely abused. And when she saw men that looked like her abuser, she had a very strong physical reaction and um, it made her scared to leave the house. And so, um, and that's a normal response to a traumatic event that is a PTSD symptom. And, um, but knowing the connection and identifying what those negative thoughts are that are a result of the trauma can really help them start to identify um, how they're going to change those to more healthy, realistic thoughts. All right, we'll go ahead and play the video. Fame Kids presents Thoughts, Feelings, and Behaviors. The human brain is amazing and complex. It helps us with everything we do from day to day. Information about the world around us is sent to the brain, which helps us make sense of the information and use it to form thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. As such, our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are all connected. When you see a small dog, you may think, that's a cute dog. This thought makes you feel happy, and so you may ask to pet and play with the dog. So, how do our brains do all of this? Let's first look at the basic building blocks of the brain, neurons. Neurons work by sending each other messages. They use chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. You see, neurons are separated in the brain, like how two islands are separated by water. Neurotransmitters act like the boats that carry messages from one island to another, so they are able to connect the two islands with information. These signals produce a response. For example, when your hand touches a hot stove, neurons will send a message to other neurons in the brain, which then quickly sends a signal down your hand to remove it. Now to look at someone who is experiencing a mental illness. When there is 
is too much or too little of a neurotransmitter, this can change how the message is received. Because of this, it might be hard for someone with a mental illness to control their feelings or change their thoughts easily. As a result, the person may have different thoughts and feelings, which we know are linked to how we act. Someone experiencing a mental illness may react to a situation differently than what others may consider normal. For example, instead of seeing a small dog and thinking that it's cute, they may think it's dangerous. Therefore, they may feel scared and would run away yelling. However, we can try our best to take care of our mental health by choosing positive thoughts. For example, let's look at some thoughts that we might have on the first day of school. You may have a negative thought about not making any new friends. Thinking about this, you feel sad and worried. From this feeling, you may end up crying. On the other hand, you can have positive thoughts. By thinking that you're going to meet new people and make new friends in your class, you feel happy. So then, you walk into class with a big smile on your face and talk to the new classmate that sits beside you. Being able to understand what is making you think or feel a certain way will help you to choose positive thoughts instead of negative thoughts. Positive thoughts help us to feel help us to feel happy. They help us to overcome our fears and to try again even when we fail. Remember these thoughts when you're faced with a tough situation. Sorry, one sec, just trying to exit here. Get back to presentation mode. Thanks for your patience. All right, so what do you guys think of that video? I think it does a nice, simple job explaining that connection, and it's something kind of nice and simple to show younger children as well. All right, so um, our next slide talks about when you have a child that has been through traumatic events. Um, it can be challenging, but try not to take their behaviors personally. Sometimes children act out because you're the safest person to be themselves with. And traumatized children might question whether you can love all parts of them, even the broken parts. And sometimes I hear that word manipulative, that you know they can be manipulative, but Actually, if we can reframe that a little bit and say that they have learned strategies to survive in order to get their needs met. So um, I know it's hard when you know, you're know you kind of uh, part of those behaviors, but if we can try not to take those personally. Um, I used to be a social worker in foster care and um, this came to mind and this was the reason I put this in here. Um, I had a foster child that um, he had a wonderful foster mom, um, but he still had some behaviors that he would exhibit that would be challenging for her. One of them was he stole some money out of her wallet. And um, she was very hurt by this, understandably, and frustrated, and um, had asked the child to be moved to a different home. Now, this child had already been moved. This was probably his fourth foster home. And as much as um, I really wanted him to stay there, she was really set on, you know, that he did this to her personally and that this was something that, um, you know, that was not acceptable in her house. So I understood that, but um, I also understood with his trauma history and being moved multiple times, this was a survival technique. You know, he probably, what he might've even had a sense that he, he was close to being moved and was, preparing and getting the money ready in case he did need to leave on his own. So that's just an example, but, um, and I know again, it's not easy when you're the one taking care of them, but as much as possible, just know that it does take time for those traumatized brains to heal. Um, I had another foster parent that I worked with that um, the child would exhibit hoarding behaviors. So he would hide food under his bed, like snacks and things like that. and. She was like, I don't understand, you know, he's been here for nine months, I have plenty of food, like, what else, you know, do I need to do? And honestly, you know, she was doing everything right, and we were working with the child, and they were getting treatment, but, um, you know, it really does take time for that child to feel safe, and for them to feel that they're not going to be moved, that they're, they're going to have enough food, they're going to have enough, you know, their basic needs met. 
So, um, you know, I just wanted to put that in here so you can try not to take those behaviors personally. And just to also let people know, sometimes the symptoms get a little bit worse before they get better when they are in treatment. So just like um, if you watch a scary movie, the first time you watch it, it's very scary. You don't know when something's gonna pop out. Um, you know, you don't know when the scary parts are, but as someone starts to tell their trauma story and they start to get into recovery and healing, um, you know, it, it kind of brings up a lot of things for them, maybe that they've pushed down, but eventually it does get better and easier and the person gets stronger. So as with a scary movie, you know, if you watch it 20 times, it's not quite so scary that 20th time because you're coming from a place of empowerment, of, have, of knowledge and safety, and you kind of know when the scary parts are coming. So, and then I also have this example of healing a wound. Uh, I got this example from some of our trauma therapists at ChildNet who share that, you know, when say that you go to the doctor and you have a wound that healed and that it healed incorrectly, there was a scab that was created, but um, it's kind of infected and it's causing problems. You know, we have to kind of clean out that wound and get the correct healing that needs to happen in order for it to get better. Smiling can be a great way just to um, calm someone down that might be a trauma victim. Um, those facial expressions are really important because often children that are a victim of trauma have gotten very good at noticing in their environment what, you know, when they're going to be unsafe. And if someone is not smiling, that can be a trait that can be a symptom for them. So if you're not quite sure what to do, um, that also can be really helpful. So as parents, we want to always be that healthy role model by being someone that our child can look up to. And children do learn more from watching and observing than just what we tell them or from correcting them. So I know that we can't control other people. We can only control ourselves. And us just always working on ourselves, being that best healthy role model for them can really help a lot because it helps the child see what their future can be if they keep moving forward. And sometimes as parents, um, you know, our children might act in a certain way that triggers us. And yes, parenting is hard and challenging. We all, you know, lose it sometimes and we get frustrated, um, but sometimes there is our own trauma that we need to work on that maybe we never got healed from. So I think that seeking support for yourself as a parent is really important. Parenting a child with trauma is challenging, so as much as possible, if you can try to get that support, that really helps a lot. Finding that professional help can, can also be great. Um, if the symptoms are lasting more than a few weeks or the problems really intensify, finding a professional who knows evidence-based strategies to help them overcome can be really great. Um, one thing that we have at ChildNet and many mental health agencies in Long Beach and other counties have is something called TFCBT, Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. So this is a, an evidence-based treatment program that many of our clients go into. Um, it's for ages three to 18, and it's done by a professional who is trained in this modality. The treatment typically lasts about 12 to 16 sessions depending on you know, if, how often the client you know, is consistent with treatment using the interventions. So this, um, this little, it's a little hard to see this handout here, but this does talk about the process of TFCBT. And just wanted to show you really quick that outline. So first we educate the client and the family about what those mental health symptoms are. Often the client feels kind of relieved when they learn what things like PTSD symptoms are, they realize that you know, this is a normal reaction to something traumatic happening. Then we teach the parent parenting skills. We teach relaxation skills. So when those uncomfortable emotions come up, they know how to calm their body. 
Then we teach about the importance of um, emotion regulation, naming feelings, as we talked about, identifying those unhelpful thoughts, which is that cognitive coping stage. Then um, towards, towards about the end of treatment, middle end, we do the trauma narrative, which is where the child gets to tell their story about what they went through and also from a place of, at the end, being able to tell the story from a place of empowerment. So yes, there's many things in our life that we didn't get to control, but as we move forward, helping them start to tell a story of a bright future. And then we have a couple other stages where we practice together. We talk about future safety, making sure that they're starting to feel more safe in the world, and also telling that trauma narrative to a caring person. That can be either with a parent or maybe um, a teacher or someone that the child chooses to share their story with. Um, we, in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna show a little video. Um, I'm gonna cut it pretty quick, but um, this video does show TFCBT therapy treatment and it shows a family that um, worked with this model and shows how it really helped the family process a trauma that happened for them. I do wanna give a quick trigger warning that um, they do talk about the death of a child. So um, please take care of yourself. If you need to take a deep breath or walk away or take a quick break, that is okay as well. The video is about, it'll be about five minutes that we show um, again, this also is on YouTube, so if you'd like to look at the full video, um, you're welcome to. I'm going to show just certain um, time periods of the video here so you can learn that process and see how this treatment really helps children overcome trauma. Clinicians and researchers from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, representing diverse professional backgrounds and areas of expertise, have collaborated and agreed on the most helpful aspects of treatment for childhood traumatic grief. The treatment incorporates elements used by experts with a more traditional psychotherapy approach and those using a more structured, skills-based format. These intervention techniques have been shown to be effective and should be individualized to the family's personal and cultural beliefs. Treatment should also be adapted to the specific needs of young children, groups, and teens. It is often best to help the child experiencing childhood traumatic grief cope with both the trauma and the grief-related reactions. In the context of a I'm sorry, Julie, I, I, we lost sound to the video. Julie, are you there? The child begins the process of confronting his or her traumatic experience in a safe, trusting, and controlled environment. One method for helping the child deal with a traumatic death is by having the child tell his or her story through the creation of a trauma narrative. A trauma narrative can be told in words, drawings, or other creative activities appropriate to the child's interest and developmental level. Completing the narrative can help reduce traumatic grief reactions and allows the child to better engage in healthy activities focused on more positive memories. Lauren entered therapy after witnessing the death of her young sister. After a gradual process where Lauren's therapist worked with her to identify and cope with distressing traumatic reminders and memories, 
Lauren was ready to address what happened to her sister. Lauren worked closely with her therapist to describe her painful experience in the form of a trauma narrative. What follows is an example of how a trauma narrative was utilized as part of a successful treatment experience. The narrative of Lauren's memories is told in her own words and drawings. On a day like any other, eight-year-old Lauren was playing on a second-floor sun porch with her younger sister, Kelsey. Lauren briefly left the porch. When she returned, she couldn't find her sister. I looked in around the house and she wasn't there. Kelsey had climbed through a window of the porch and fallen from a second-story window to the ground below. I went outside to see if Kelsey was okay. I was staring at her. Her eyes were closed. Lauren immediately ran to get her father. Dad, Kelsey's on the ground. We went outside. My dad was holding Kelsey's head. I felt sad and a little scared. They called the ambulance and waited the long minutes for it to arrive. In Lauren's case, her parents brought her to therapy about six months after the death of her sister, and she still experienced, as you would expect, um, a lot of anxiety, sadness, nightmares, difficulty sleeping, um, and even some avoidance. She avoided playing in the backyard, for example, because that's where she found her sister. Every time she would experience a daily reminder of her sister, just even a positive memory, that would simultaneously trigger the traumatic memories so that the usual grieving process would be halted or interrupted. Um, so creating this trauma narrative is a way to help the child guide the child through telling their story, just a little at a time, gently guiding them through it, but always encouraging them to move forward. I don't think people, particularly children, have the ability to just walk their way instinctively through those trauma responses. It really needs a special kind of guidance. The trauma narrative. I'm just gonna forward a tiny bit here to the very end. Amidst the problems of today's society, a vision is emerging. While we will never be able to completely eliminate the suffering in our children's lives, every day we are learning that there are ways to help. Every day, parents, teachers, and healthcare professionals all across the country are proving that help is on the way. Together, as we strive for a brighter future, we can help our children understand that there is hope, that they can heal, and it's okay to remember. All right, hopefully that video was helpful to kind of show the process. Um, that website, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network is excellent. They have some great resources and um, some handouts for parents and I highly recommend their resource. All right, we're just about done here. Thanks for your time and patience. Just a couple more slides here. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight that's come out recently is something called post-traumatic growth. And as we see people overcome traumatic events, we find that it changes them in a way that in some ways um, helps them grow. And so the work that they do can help them make meaning out of something that can be so senseless. Sometimes it's a new appreciation for life a newfound sense of personal strength, maybe a new focus on helping others. And um, there is a scale that was developed. Um, it's called the Post-Traumatic Growth Inventory um, and by Tadeshi and Calhoun, which is a great resource as well.
So we know that it can change us and also in some ways that um, help us to become a better person in the world. So some great resources out there. We have the Trauma Resource Institute, National Child Traumatic Stress Network, as I just showed the video from, the Safe Start Center, which is the Office of Juvenile and Delinquency Prevention, www.traumahealing.org. I probably don't have to say the www, but whatever, <laughs> it's in there. Um, Nonviolent Communication Book by Marshall Rosenberg is an excellent resource for how to communicate in a way that um, helps others to listen and for them to feel heard. And our Long Beach Trauma Recovery Center is a great resource. They provide free counseling for victims of trauma, both youth and adults. And also ChildNet, of course, where I work. Um, this is our main phone number. If you do have a child age zero to 18 that has any kind of emotional trauma, um, we can help with that. They do have to have Medi-Cal insurance. So, um, but if your child has Medi-Cal, please give us a call and we would love to help your child. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, there is a quick survey that Will is gonna put in the chat box. If you don't mind Will doing putting that survey in there. Um, we are a, ChildNet is a DMH contracted provider and um, these surveys really help us learn about if these types of topics are helpful and if you would like more of these types of trainings so thank you so much for joining us today. Also in the, um, I just wanted to say the survey is very short. It's like three, four questions. So if you click on the survey link, it won't take you out of the training. I know that Will wants to stay. We are gonna make a couple announcements for the school district. So please hang on, don't leave yet. Um, and the survey link will be in there as well. And as you're doing that, just one more, I did have a question in the chat box and I apologize if you heard me typing. <laughs> I was typing a response during the video, but then that was a little, I'm a loud typer, I think. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, one participant asked, um, they shared that they have a two-year-old that had some trauma in, um, in her history and um, they weren't sure. She hasn't talked about the trauma and they know they don't want to force her to talk about it, but um, as they, she hasn't really talked about it yet. So they were kind of wondering if there's anything they can do to kind of like help her to talk about it more. Um, so what I was typing was that I, um, you definitely don't want to force anyone to talk about something they're not ready to do. So um, at two years old, I would say she may not even have the verbal skills to be able to um, name what was happening. A lot of it might have been, um, as we call, like pre-verbal things were happening, but, you know, they didn't have the language capacity yet. So I would say at two years old, you know, as a parent, I would just, as long as you're creating that safe, loving, consistent environment, um, that's going to help the child to heal and overcome from that. And then also, you know, if she's able to do any kind of therapy to, um, if there is symptoms that are coming up, um, there is therapy for that age group as well. So thank you, Will. I think that's it. If there's any other questions, I'll stay on for a couple minutes, but thanks so much for your time, everybody. And I'll stop the share in case. Thank you, you so it. much, like, Julie. Um, I, I think maybe that was the, um, the question one of the participants had asked to make sure that you were able to see your chat. Um, okay. I, I, I think that might be the question, but again, um, it's always um, great to have you on sharing your knowledge and helping our Long Beach Unified community. We appreciate everybody that is here today. Um, waiting for Kim, if you're able to share the screen. There we go. So just wanted to make a couple announcements. Um, Next month, we are having our, I, I can't believe it's already going to be May, um, but we are going to have um, the second part in our three-part series um, for our Spring Parent well, Wellness webinar series. Um, next month's um, webinar is titled Positive Communication for Parents and Teens, and that's going to be on the 4th of May. Um, same format as today's, our, our Spanish uh, workshop will be on at 10 a.m. and our English uh, workshop will be on at 11.30 a.m. 
to stay updated and to stay connected with everything that we have going on at our family resource centers, please feel free to follow and maybe set your notifications for our social media platforms. We are on Twitter and we are also on Instagram at LBUSDFRC. We are also on YouTube, um, which is why we're recording today's session. Uh, we will be posting these at a later date, uh, depending on when we can get them added on there. So please feel free to follow us on the Long Beach Unified YouTube channel. Um, if you click on the playlists, you'll see the Family Resource Centers webinar series. That is all we have for today. Um, we thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much to our friend Julie. Um, on behalf of myself um, and my, my esteemed co-workers, Kimberly, Yeremia, and Roxy Carboni from the Family Resource Centers, we appreciate you guys, and we will see you guys next month. Goodbye. <laughs>